In this example problem, we're going to calculate the time, approximate time at least, for an object to fall into the sun when it's released from rest at a distance of one astronomical unit, so that's at the orbit of the Earth, and calculate the speed when this object would uh, hit the photosphere of the sun, at least approximately. So this object is one astronomical unit away from the sun. This drawing is not to scale. But here's our sun, one astronomical unit away. And uh, we want to know the length of time to fall into the sun. So I'd ask you a question here. Do you think the speed of the object is constant as it moves towards the sun? And it started with no velocity out here when it's released. Do you think the rate of motion is constant? <clears throat> well, obviously, no. If the rate was constant, it started with zero, it'd stay at zero, it'd just sit out here. And that's not physical, there's nothing holding it uh, up here. So this first equation is illegal, it cannot be used. Uh, distance equals rate times time, the rate is not a constant, so this first equation must not be used. So secondly, as the object falls towards the sun, could we use this kinematic equation that our position is our initial position plus our original velocity multiplied by time plus one half times acceleration times t squared. Can we use that? Think about the motion here. So the object starts moving towards the sun. Why does it move towards the sun? Because there's acceleration. The force of gravity is causing acceleration of this object. Is the force of gravity constant as we move towards the sun? And that answer is no. As this object moves towards the sun, the distance is smaller. If I would write this out here, the force of gravity is you know, capital G, mass of one object, mass of the other object, and divide by r squared. The r value is getting smaller. The force is getting bigger. The acceleration is getting larger. This equation can only be used if the acceleration is constant. So we cannot use either of these two equations. They're illegal for this situation. What I am going to do is I'm going to imagine, suppose this uh, object came down here, whipped around the center of the sun, and came back out on an orbit, a very elliptical orbit. This, of course, ignores the fact that the, the object gets vaporized when it uh, gets too near the sun and can't move through the mass of the sun. But hypothetically, if we just had a point mass here that's the mass of the sun, and this was just a little bit offset, something uh, disturbs a little bit, so it goes uh, near this mass but doesn't hit the mass, then we can consider this to be a long elliptical orbit. This gives us a tremendous advantage in that for elliptical orbits in the solar system, we know how to calculate the relationship between the period and the semi-major axis. Kepler's third law, early 1600s, P squared equals A cubed as long as P is measured in years and A is in astronomical units and the orbiting, the object that we're orbiting is the sun. This does not work for the relationship of period and orbit size for the moon around the earth or some satellite of Jupiter around Jupiter. Uh, for this to be valid, P has to be in years, A has to be in astronomical units, and the object must be orbiting something that has the mass of the sun. Uh, so with a long elliptical orbit like this, the full axis is one astronomical unit. So the semi-major axis, the symbol A is semi-major axis, that's going to be 0.5 AUs. So we have a value for the semi-major axis. We can solve for the period. So let's go ahead and put in that value. When you cube 0.5 astronomical units, that 0.5 becomes 0.125 after it's cubed. And now you have to take a square root. Try this with your calculator. I came up with 0.354 years. So less than a year, less than the orbit of the Earth. That's reasonable because our orbit is the semi-major axis for this object is 0.5 AU where the semi-major axis for the Earth is 1 AU. Notice that if I put a 1 in here for the semi-major axis of the Earth, I get 1 for the value of the period, 1 year. That checks. So half, and this 0.354 years, that's a full orbit. That's from our starting point back to the starting point. We only wanted to get to the Sun. 
So that's going to happen in 0.177 years, half of the 0.354. If we convert that to days, we find a couple of months, 64.6 .6 years, just by falling into the sun, no rocket motion, just falling. What about the speed? For the speed, I'm going to use conservation of energy. At the start, out at 1 AU, we have a potential in a kinetic energy uh, in symbols. This kinetic energy is going to be at zero. We said we release the object from rest. So the initial kinetic energy is zero. It'll have a potential energy that's calculated with a minus sign, uh, the constant of gravitation, the two masses that are involved, and R, not R squared. The force involves R squared, but not the potential energy calculation. When we get to the photosphere at the sun, then we're going to have a potential energy and a kinetic energy at that point. And this initial potential energy is being converted, part of it at least, into kinetic energy of the object. There'll still be some potential energy because we're at the photosphere. Um, so we'll calculate that number. So here's our uh, conservation of energy situation. Again, the potential energy has a negative sign. It's important to include that. So I'm going to use mass of the sun, mass of the object that's falling. R1, that's where we start, one astronomical unit. No initial kinetic energy. When we get to the photosphere, then mass of the sun, mass of the object, the distance out to the photosphere from the center of the sun. These R's are measured from the center of the sun. And I have one half mass of the object and the velocity squared. What do you notice here about mass of the object? Well, it appears in every term, so that can be canceled off. It doesn't matter what uh, we release and what we let fall in. So let's put in the numbers. So we have the uh, constant of gravitation, 6.674, 10 to the minus 11. Mass of the sun, 1.99 times 10 to the 30th kilograms, at least approximately. And one astronomical unit, at least approximately 1.496 times 10 to the 11th meters. Our gravitational constant again, mass of the sun again. But here is the distance out to the photosphere. So do a Google search and you can find the uh, uh, distance out to the photosphere. Uh, 6.957 times 10 to the 8th. That's a 10 to the 8th meters number. And then 1 half V squared just becomes V squared over 2. Again, mass of the object cancels in every term. So let's go a little bit further with the calculation. And probably you should. Uh, even now, pause. You're trying to calculate V. So first I've calculated the value of each term. So minus 8.8778 times 10 to the 8th on the left. This first term on the right, minus 1.909 times 10 to the 11th, and then plus V squared over 2. So I combine the numbers. That equals V squared over 2. I multiply by 2, and then I take a square root. I came up with 6.16 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. 6.16 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. Uh, just as a quick check, any speed that I calculate should be less than the speed of light. Speed of light is 3 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. So um, at least from that point, it's a, a legitimate number. So. That's the end here. We've uh, determined that if we release an object from rest, and there are no planets, there's just this object uh, one astronomical unit away from the sun, so no other gravitational influence other than the sun. We approximate this answer by saying we have an elliptical orbit. This object's not going to make it all the way to the center of the sun. It's going to be destroyed before it reaches uh, the uh, left side of our orbit here. Uh, at the center of the sun, but approximately, you know, ballpark number, two months for this object to get to the sun. And using conservation of energy, we calculated the speed when it hits the photosphere, 6.16, 10 to the fifth meters per second. So ask your instructor if you have any questions on this. And if you uh, would like to see some other physics and astronomy videos, these two websites are free, no registration. You'll see a list of videos, and the uh, uh, there's a link to the YouTube video at the site. If you enjoy the YouTube videos, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. That's free also.